welcome to yet another fabulous episode of Cup of Linux. And uh, since we're not going to be doing a Zoo Crew next week, it's going to be a team. I figured I'd invite all my uh, subscribers and contributors and everybody. We're all sitting here on Mumble right now. And we thought we'd have a nice little discussion on Windows. You wouldn't believe it, but everybody... Um, after our little A-team discussion, said that would be a wonderful idea. Let's go hit on Windows for a little bit. Now, personally, I've used Windows for many years, and I think it's a wonderful operating system for most people. However, I stumbled upon Linux because of the fact I got sick of getting so many viruses! You know, and, uh, you know, and the thing is, I found that Linux has really matured to a point where it is ready for the desktop. Now, before we get started on this discussion, Edward, why don't you welcome all of our guests? Okie dokie then, since I'm the co-host. We've got Andy Arch, we've got Bartos, we have Lixa, we have Preacher, we have Shaf, Skypup03, we have yourself, we have Stats, the Arch Noob, we also have Y2B. All right, welcome one and all, and so good to have you all here. And the nice thing about this is, to all of my listeners out there on my YouTube channel, there are going, there's information in the show notes for connecting to us, and you are more than welcome to join these podcasts every Saturday night. I have them, and you can participate not only through IRC, but also you can join through Mumble and actually listen as these shows are being recorded. And this is your opportunity to be a part of this show. How many show hosts out there do you know that are doing something like that? I figured, you know, we need to have something like this in the community so that everybody has a voice. And I'm so happy to have all of you here again. And uh, I think this is going to make for a great discussion. Now, the first thing that comes to mind for me... Uh, about Windows is viruses. I, you know, I just got sick and tired of viruses sneaking in through Java, this and that, this and that, you know, and it just got to be a real headache for me, you know, plus not only that, but to keep the Windows operating system running quickly, I had to defragment once a week, I had to clean my registry, I had to do this and do that and do this and do that, and I just don't have to do those things in Linux anymore. Or right, Andy Arch, your turn, tell me about Windows. All right, uh, Spadry, uh, the one thing that that really gets me about Windows is that every time when I'm when I'm doing some kind of task or anything like that, I'm just not certain if I'm getting viruses or not. And and you may probably know that they, in, including in your registry or anything that's running in the background of your system, you don't know that you may possibly get a virus, that, but you may not even know it because it may. I mean you. Project, you may not be able to see it running, but in in fact, it, it, it might get you might be running a virus in your system through behind the scenes, and because you may not know that you may have a virus in your system, but it may be lurking around in your file system, and you may not you may not even know it. You know, another thing uh, that Edward had pointed out was. The registry too. Tell us about that, Edward. Well, like like you notice with Windows, you start off with a nice fresh system. It's all nice and fast and zippy, and you think, "Ooh, let's customize it." So then you start downloading programs, you start installing stuff. You think, "Ooh, no, I don't like that program, so I'll take that off." But after the stuff gets left behind in the registry, and it just starts cluttering up, and the the Windows seems to try and find these files in the registry when you load up programs and it's taking up too much time for it to check the disk all the time that's why that's why it seems to slow down after time and the only way you can really get rid of it properly is to reinstall windows but then you've got to start all over again with customizing it again yeah i agree that can be quite a bit of a headache elixir uh, your turn 
Oh man, well I come from the Mac world, so I can't say much. Okay, well then, start hating on Mac, will ya? Alright, well, number one is it's insanely stupidly. It's stupid to use, really. You have, like, there's nothing you can do to the system at all. You're with an inconfigurable desktop, and, you know, you can't really do much. And, I mean, there aren't really any viruses, luckily, as Windows. And uh, the worst, I think, out of all of it would have to be the programs. Just all the programs are crap. <laughs> you know what? I had somebody send me a photograph of these three people that says, uh, you know, that says an update is available. And uh, the Windows user goes, oh, no, not again. The Mac user goes, wow, only $99. And the Linux user goes, wow, more free software. Like like people were saying, um, on Mac, there's all the stupid user agreements that you've got to agree to everything. Even if you update, like, say, uh, QuickTime, you now need to accept our terms and conditions just in case we need to file a lawsuit against you. And it's just stupid because in Linux, you don't get all these stupid use, uh, user agreements to accept. Um, and like you were saying, there's not much you can change in, in Mac, really, apart from the wallpaper and what you have on your dock. Maybe you can add stuff to your top bar, like, to record your desktop or whatever, but there's not really much in terms of customizing. Yeah, and the thing is, Linux is the customizer's dream. Now, I'm, you know, I think the biggest problem that I'm going to have, that I have with Windows 8 pretty much is just the fact that... Um, that Metro interface has to go. It is absolutely wretched, in my opinion. But it's great for... Uh, but it's it's really great for um, touchpads or touchscreens and that sort of thing. And I think a lot of people are really going to like that. I think it's going to be a wonderful operating system for the tablets. But really for the desktop, mm, I don't know about that one. Edward, you said you had a little comment. Yeah, like, similar to what you were saying, um, just like when they boot up the system on Windows, just say, are you using a touch PC or are you using a desktop? Because Windows 8 really needs to make the mind up whether the user wants to have Metro UI or the classic Windows 7. So maybe when they first install Windows 7, and like say the OEMs, if the pre-built like HP bring out a new desktop with Windows 8 on, should have just the desktop um, environment because it, obviously it's a desktop. But say the download, the buy a custom version, they should say, are you using a desktop or a um, tablet or a touchscreen computer? Other than that, it should just only come with um, tablet PCs or touchscreen. Skypop, what do you think? Okay, uh, as far as... Um... I've used Windows actually since probably the early 90s um, when I was really young and um, I was actually the second computer my family got. I was the one who installed the operating system and I was like, I don't know, 12. Um, the thing I've always really just sort of really resented about it is what everybody else is actually talking about is the, the issue with viruses, um, Internet Explorer being the default browser and being exposed to a lot of a lot of exploits that I can't even, I'm not going to even spend the time with right now. And um, I know it sounds like a really nitpicky thing, but I hate having my in front of everything, like my files, my documents. I don't know, maybe I'm just a commie, I don't know, but it bugs me. Um, and as far as everything else, it just seems like I, I resent that it, it the level of measures that have gone throughout the years to just completely try to obfuscate any other possibilities and that's terrible and from a I think from a programming point of view. Staz, what do you got to say? Well, I've used um Windows and, and like a lot of people and, and and it's it's basically that's what's you know running in the world and, and the Mac. But I think the main problem is it's it's become too too locked down and it's too way way too automated like there's always little things flashing up on the screen do you want me to do this do you want me to do that and, and it drives me crazy because when i have had to boot it up um you have to wait for all the um stuff to be updated virus checkers and and really that's and and all the permissions as as edward was saying to, um go along with it it's 
that's really it just slows everything down once it's up and running it's fine but um i much prefer my uh, my linux stuff now arch new your turn okie dokie well i like i said i'm pretty new to linux in general especially arch and i've played around with windows for a lot while and my first experience with windows was millennium edition which, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much what I said. And it, it by far to me is one of the most worst examples of an operating system and what it should be. Windows XP, I didn't mind so much. I like Windows XP. It's okay for what it is. It's still Windows, but it's okay for what it is. And then Windows Vista come along and just completely messed everything up. And, you know, then they put out Windows 7, which was a lot better than Vista. Is it still Linux? No. Um, and now they're coming out with this heap of stinking dog excrement windows 8 <laughs> what what does the 8 stand for if you turn it sideways it's the symbol of infinity and in the symbol of infinity by infinite they mean infinite ways to screw the world over they have proved once again what they are completely capable of as a massive operation and I would have to agree that uh, Microsoft has some pretty nasty little tactics. We're going to get into that in a minute. This is probably one of the biggest things that I hated about upgrading Windows. One year, I remember uh, I was running uh, Windows um, 8 Second Edition, and I skipped over the Millennium Edition entirely because that was absolutely wretched and I will agree with that one and I had just bought a new printer and it worked beautifully with Windows 8 it was less than a year old I upgraded to XP and then all of a sudden it wouldn't work and the manufacturer refused to make a driver for Windows XP and I, uh, this stinking little thought entered my mind that I wonder if Microsoft is actually paying these OEMs not to distribute drivers for their newer operating system to force people to go out and buy a new printer, that sort of thing. Or, you know, I mean, there's got to be something at play here. Andy Arch, you're first. Yeah, uh, uh, it's bad. I had to agree with you on that, man. Um, yeah, uh, I know one experience one time when, uh, when I got my first um, system. And um, and it went and the only systems that makes uh, driver CDs are for one that I'm familiar with are uh, Dell systems, and uh, but I'm talking about um, more of the other ones like HP, um, those kind of, those um, lines right there. At one time I was installing my um, another version of, of Windows on it, and I'm thinking, oh. This didn't came. This did not, not came with no driver CD or anything. Heck, it did not even came came with a uh, separate partition of anything. And I thought, oh crap! And I thought, whoa! I thought, uh, I so I tried seeing if they can I can get tech support with it and see if they can fork out like a driver CD or anything, something like that. And I thought, okay, you're going to fork over like a hundred hundred dollars or hundred fifty. Edward, your turn. Yeah, that's, um, they try and make you buy the latest, like, printers and stuff, and they have all these little stickers saying, Windows 7 compatible or Windows 7 certified. So they expect you to also have the latest uh, version of Windows, because people don't want to be scouring around drivers. They just want a better plug and play. And I think Windows 7 and 8 have done quite a good a good deal on that, where you can just put it in and it'll find it on Windows Update. But um, apart from that, if you've got really old printers and they haven't made any support and there's no drivers out there now, there's not really going to be any drivers out there ever. You're just going to have to buy a new, a new product, like with cameras or with, um, with printers especially. But with Linux, nine times out of ten, it'll work on Linux. 
Exactly, and it's not only hardware. I forgot to throw into the mix software as well. So, for instance, I I, I happened to love the product that Macromedia came out called with called Flash Paper. It worked beautifully in Windows XP, but I could not get it to work in Windows Vista or Windows 7. And this, of course, is clearly to force you into uh, buying newer software to fill the coffers of all the software distributors and everything out there. So not only is it a hardware issue, it is a software issue as well. Lixer, your turn. All right, so yeah, that's what Microsoft, I think, wants in some cases. They want to not have this, they don't want compatibility with some things because they want people to just go out and spend the extra money to get their upgrades or get more. Or if they have deals with other companies, they can help out the other companies by just not supporting it, and then they get all this money to upgrade and do all sorts of weird things just to get a little bit extra cash. Oh, and uh, I'm going to throw another wrench into this machine in just a few moments. First, uh, let's go ahead and pass the microphone over to Shaf. Oh, hi. Um, satisfactory. Yeah, you're perfectly correct. Um, driver support on Windows absolutely does suck. It, they just aim for the minimum hardware set and leave the onus to the um, actual hardware um, OEM uh, manufacturers. Um, but... On, on the plus side, I mean, you're perfectly right. Linux, for me, definitely the best um, hardware support out there. Really is. The, the community is there. And there's no doubt enough the flaws. Uh, this It's just flawless as far as the uh, Linux um, drives are concerned. But um, whether it's a little bit of a conspiracy, I'm not, sh I'm not too sure. Um, it's just been offloaded. The driver support has been offloaded, and the onus is on the uh, manufacturers. So whether they decide to support a new version of uh, Windows is entirely up to them. So I'm not sure if it is a uh, um, a little form of uh, you know I don't know if it's a conspiracy or not. I don't know. Sky Pop, your turn. The thing that I was wondering, I've just been thinking about, is that we pay the Microsoft Windows tax every time you buy a computer, but a lot of OEMs just ship you with it like on a partition. You don't even actually get the original install CD. And when you look at how much it all costs, you're spending a lot of money. So you're also talking about an operating system that, generally speaking, works best with a reinstall every at least once a year. <laughs> but you have no disk to do it with that works effectively. Or if you wanted to try another operating system and then go back to Windows, that's certainly your cup of tea. Um, Linux has been very supportive for people who want to do that, but Windows has shown absolutely none, of course, and that's, I guess that's they were entitled to. If it was a fair deal, like you, you go and buy your new system, Windows, and, and et cetera, et cetera, like you used to, it was a different thing a few years ago, but now, like... Like what a lot of people have been saying, if you're buying um, software and, and things become incompatible and you get tied up in a lot of stuff and, and it becomes a bad deal, basically. It's really just a big monopoly. I mean, let's face it, that's all Windows is, is a big monopoly. I mean, they've been in the business for so many years and they have such a chokehold on all of these other corporations that, you know, you work with us and do what we want you to do or else. And that's what they got in trouble with so many years ago. That's why what happened happened. Okay, and interestingly enough, I was just reading an article that Linus Torvalds, the father of Linux himself, has actually been doing something to thwart the Microsoft scheme about these patents and everything that they've been trying to uh, push down people's throats. And an example of this was using long file names in a FAT32 file system. And this was something that was discussed years before Microsoft had purchased the patents for it. And there's documentation that can actually be viewed online. It's on the Muktiware website and uh, that sort of thing. So we know that they're using all these terrible little tactics. They're taking other people's ideas, they're putting patents on them, and then going around and suing people. And Mr. Tervals himself is now doing his part to 
show just how flawed this system is. Edward, you had something you wanted to say. Let me pass the mic over to you before I throw the wrench in the machine. <laughs> um, all I was going to say when you were wasn't about uh, when you get windows with a distro on a partition. Some people don't always know about um, partition management, so say they get uh, windows on a separate partition and they think oh i'll try linux i'll put ubuntu on they'll put in erase everything on my partitions and merge it into one and start afresh when they commit to install ubuntu on it might they might end up forgetting that they've got a separate partition for recovering windows and they might overwrite it that's it then they've lost the copy of windows that came with the machine that is why they should start sending Windows 7 with the machine rather than onto a partition because if you lose any data on the partition or the device gets corrupted or the, the device fails, that's it, you've lost your copy of Windows then. So that's that's the only problem that I have with when the OEMs put Windows on an actual hard drive. <laughs> and uh, my buddy Pingcast suggested the Pirate Bay. Don't do it unless you actually have the sticker on the machine. <laughs> now, vendor lock-in. Here's my wrench. I'm throwing it in the machine. We're going to talk vendor lock-in. And now, uh, we have this new boot feature called the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. It's going to replace BIOS, which is the basic input-output system. And now, Microsoft, of course, has backed off a little bit to allow OEMs to ship systems with this new UEFI with the ability to shut it off except on ARM devices. Any ARM device, notably tablets, that ship with the new Windows 8 will not let you remove Windows 8 or even dual boot that device to run Linux. And they are getting really obsessed with ARM as a uh, Pincast is pointing out, and uh, some really nasty stuff going on there. Andy, your turn. Well, uh, it's Patrick. Um, as in, to be honest, man, I've never actually been kept up to date on the latest technology of what Microsoft has been pushing out. And um, like I've been telling myself, I've been used to to the regular BIOS, basic, basic uh, BIOS, and. Um, and I think that this new tactic that they're using, it's insanely enough to me, I'm thinking that they're forcing um, users that either getting tablets that with Windows, Windows 8 are being forced to use their operating system instead of Linux. So I think that's kind of a bummer in my opinion. So, Bartos, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, my only thing with uh, the new bootloader, yeah, they locked it up on ARM, but is that just the start, or are they going to actually continue? Because they're trying to get on the phones, which are all ARM right now, so I think once the new Windows 8 comes out on uh, machines, computers, laptops, you'll see it more locking down on those machines, too. They'll, uh, they'll apply the same. Edward. Well, I think if they do um, lock it to everyone, then a lot of people are going to end up buying new computers because people want to have freedom to put Linux on. But I think the reason they're doing it with us, they might be realising maybe people are going to start trying to turn ARM as well. So maybe they might think, oh, what happens if they get our tablet and put Arch on it? Or what happens if they get our little tablet PC and put Arch on and they take Windows 8 off? They don't want to be losing Windows customers, do they? Especially when they're paying for it. They can, Windows can make money off of it. Even though someone's already paid for the device that came with Windows, people might think, well, I don't want to buy a copy of Windows 8 if it didn't come with it. I'd rather just put Arch. That's why they're trying to lock it down, so people stop using free um, distributions and start using Windows, and they don't want to lose all the, the millions of pounds in revenue. Just one of those things, let the buyer beware. Know what you are purchasing and don't buy products that lock you out of using your hardware the way you want to use it. Plain and simple. Lixer, you're next. Alright, so we all you guys have gone over it now, but there's actually there's a lot there's a there's a whole deal with actually the US government and um 
Microsoft in like, I don't know, 1995 or the mid-90s, that Microsoft had no permission or cannot lock down hardware to prevent operating like Linux from booting. Well, that it's still in, it's still going. And phones and armed things like that, they're PCs. Phones and tablets are PCs, essentially. So technically, they're violating that agreement. According to what Pincast was mentioning, Microsoft is arguing that tablets or any ARM-based devices are not personal computers. But guess what? These devices can run just about anything that an average computer can run. So, the, so what they're trying to push is moot. You know, uh, I think... I think this is just another form of control and vendor lock-in. They're going to use any tactics that they can possibly use to force people to stay with their operating system. And this is something they're doing out of fear because Linux has a large following. You'll remember the netbook craze that happened in the early 2000s. Linux was shipping out on netbooks. We had Mego and we had other Linux distributions that were going out. And Microsoft's answer was to immediately release XP Service Pack 3. Vista was already out, so they released XP Service Pack 3 so that they could get netbooks on the shelves and force OEMs to keep pushing Windows because they just don't want Linux in people's hands. They don't want people to see that Linux is actually something that they can put to good use. Chef, you're next. Is it Linux or is it Android that they're trying to stop? That's what I want to know. Uh, but um, overall, I think uh, where there's a will, there's a way. And as the Linux community has shown in the past, this UAFI um, BIOS can easily be removed and we'll get away around it. Exactly. The Linux community has a bunch of brilliant people out there. But you know what? Microsoft has already shut down somebody who has figured out a way to get past the UEFI restrictions, claiming a Digital Millennium Copyright Act against that person and got them shut down. But the thing is, if there is enough people out there getting this information out to people, there's no way Microsoft's going to be able to stop it. Skypup, you're next. Oh, thank you, Spatry. Um, Matthew Garrett of uh, Red Hat has a lot of stuff. Um, there's a video of him talking a lot about the UEFI, um, and I, he says it better than I really could. Um, the main thing is that it's going to require signed keys, and I, uh, I think rather optimistically on his blog, he said that they would take about a weekend's worth of coding. I'm not sure about that, ever seeing the video. Um, he said it has, the problem, part of the problem with UEFI is it itself has quite a few bugs, and um, it's a very large code base that they're going to have to go over. And it also causes problems who want for people who want to compile their own kernels because you will not be able to sign your own kernel to en enable the boot feature on that. S Stats, your turn. Yeah, thanks, Petri. It's a general comment, really, but because just listening to you guys, it's it's interesting. Um, the um, I, I just wonder how long that um, a company can keep on locking things down like this and how long will people sort of um, really want to put up with it? I've got a feeling it, it's got to work against it in the long run. And, you know, it, it can't be uh, a good thing. I don't think people really want to be that locked down. Okay. Um, you know, you're talking about the UEFI and everything. I, I have run UEFI with Arch Linux and... I don't really have that much of a trouble with it. Um, for those that do, there is a boot manager out now that's called eLilo, and it's supposed to be able to work its way around. I'll post a link in the IRC for it if anybody was to ever have any trouble with it. But as far as it goes, um, yeah, there's that's going to. For every virus, there's a way to stop it. For every way to stop it, there's a new virus to get around the way to stop it. It's that way for piracy, and it's going to be that way for everything that Windows tries to come out with. The Linux community is really going to uh, give Microsoft a really good fight, you know, and uh, I have a feeling that this, this tactic that they're employing to lock people in really is 
not going to hamper anybody who really wants to get what they want done on their hardware. They're going to use Google search. They're going to use DuckDuckGo. They're going to hit the major search engines. They're going to find the answers, and they're going to figure out how to uh, jailbreak their devices and that sort of thing. And, you know, you know, you can put an end-user license agreement on software, but I don't see how they can put an end user license agreement on actual hardware. Go ahead, Edward. I was going to say before, like, as long as there's zeros and ones in, like, you know, zeros and ones commands, you know, ons and offs, whatever computers use to communicate, there's going to be hackers who can get into it. As long as there's pieces of information, there's always going to be a hack. And while there's YouTube and Google, people are going to find ways around it. There's no way that Google or Microsoft can say this is proper locked in. There's no way around it. We have you under, you know, Alcatraz. There's always, there's always a way the means around things. And it's just about people taking the time and researching doing it. Because whatever they have done can be redone. They can hack into it. I mean, look at all these big, massive websites that have been hacked into and lost half of the information because someone's hacked into the servers. And these are big corporations. In just the past year alone, I have seen so much innovation come to Linux. It's been unbelievable to see all these new things that are coming out. It, it really is amazing to see that uh, people are stepping up to the plate and they're bringing, you know, new desktop experiences they're bringing, uh, you know, and they're bringing all kinds of new and exciting innovations to Linux. But uh, the biggest thing that's holding a number of people back from trying Linux is the fact that, well, there really isn't much software compatibility. You know, um, for instance, I get a lot of people on my channel that say, well, Linux just doesn't play the games. Yeah. Get a PlayStation if you want to play games, you know? Computers are for computing. But the thing is, I do have a section on my channel where I cover a lot of free Linux games. There are tons of them out there, you know? And the thing is, now that I'm running Linux, I'm never going to have to pay for another game again. And the thing is, just about every software that, that I can think of that I need for my everyday life is available. Free. And it's good software. Andy Arch, you're next. Right. Yeah, I I have to agree with you, Patrick. There's a there is a really good um amount of free software out there, especially in the um in the Ubuntu Software Center or in the uh, Synaptic Package Manager. I mean, I've been playing um this game on is a FPS shooter for like for like uh thirty minutes or so, but I was really but I really this uh, game called uh, Savage uh, 2. Y'all may have heard of that one. Um, it's mainly a um, MMORPG, and this game is just awesome. I mean, for a free game of something like that, where you get to join other players online and just having a good old time, it is just excellent. That's free, you know. Now it's interesting that you point that out because last night before I did my did my uh, game overview on Mega Glass Three, I was actually looking at Savage Two, and that is an amazing looking game. But the thing is, a lot of times when I'm playing games, I just want to have a nice single player component. Maybe I'm just not in the mood to deal with other people online, and I just want to, you know. So I haven't had a chance to research it enough to see if this would be something that I could do in a single player if they had any single player scenarios and stuff that you could play out and that sort of thing that would be of interest to me uh edward you're next yeah there's plenty of games for linux but not all as linux people are gamers so we might want to dual boot windows we might want to run it in a virtual machine um like you said there's a good selection of software out there for linux and it's just all about of researching and finding End of day, all you need to focus upon is not what the software's called, is what it actually does. So say you want a decent video editor, like you say, there's Caden Live, there's OpenShot. There's always tutorials online. You just need to find what you're looking for and just what you need your general computer to do. It's all about how easy you can find the software. All right, and uh, uh, while we're on the topic of uh, gaming, somebody says, well... <laughs> I've got a high 
A high 675, 445 says he's got an Xbox. Well, yeah, um, then again, more Microsoft vendor lock in there. So uh, I, that's why I've been recommending PlayStation to everybody. <laughs> but uh, Lixer, you're next. Um, all right, yeah, so there are plenty of games for Linux. I mean, there aren't the big blockbuster titles like uh, Battlefield and Call of Duty and all of that, but I mean, uh, I think people should really be looking at gameplay rather than if the game is all amazing in graphics and all that. I mean, Linux has some pretty decent games out there that also I think I would enjoy more than playing Battlefield or Call of Duty out of all of them. I have to agree with you there. You know, there are a and some of these games that Linux are that Linux is putting out are pretty difficult too, even on the easy levels. You know, and they're really fun. Just you can have a good time instead of being all competitive about it. Just have a blast instead. And I think I think people are really starting to lose that value in just playing for fun instead of for competitiveness. Oh yeah, for gaming, oh, definitely. Um, Windows, unfortunately, because um, all the uh, games are optimized for Windows. It's just like uh, the food chain just goes around consoles first, and then they decide to port it to PC. And even during the port, uh, they get a lot of the code wrong, so that the poor Windows users have got uh, highly unoptimized games, which they've all been complaining about, but have to put up with. It's ridiculous. Uh, for Linux, and then uh, you, I, I see a lot of people trying to um, uh, emulate and run games under Wine and so forth, but I've not really tried to, so I'm mostly a Windows gamer, I'm afraid. Skypup. Hi. Yeah, I'm not a big gamer. I, I don't know. I hate to be disappoint, but I'm really not. I'm kind of curious, though, like, after this next development of the, the Wine uh, project, you know, how long it's going to take Apple to break any... Uh, uh, Mac compatibility that might be in wine. Yeah, I think the biggest Linux haters out there are gamers. You know, because they can't play their favorite game in Linux. But let's face it, I've asked a lot of people during my lifetime if they play much games on the computers. And you know what? There's a lot of people that really don't do that much games on their computers. They do the, you know, they do other things. You know, they manage their finances. They, you know, just do emailing and that sort of thing. But gaming is still wonderful on Linux for what we have available. Stats, your turn. Oh, thanks, Patrick. Yeah, I'm not a big gamer, but I, I kind of agree with what you said that, um, I mean, if, you, if you're into the gaming, you know, get a gaming box, so to speak, and but if you really want to uh, have a good operating system, Linux is, is fantastic. And also, I just wanted to mention the um, how brilliant it is that Linux has come as far as it has, considering how many um, types of um, things it has to run on and compete with. And we have to give it its dues there. Exactly. You know, I take my computer to the coffee shop all the time. And I'm sitting here wobbling my windows, and I'm moving around all my applications in 3D and that sort of thing. And people looking over my shoulder, they're like, wow, what is this? You know, and I, I'm basically telling them I'm running Linux with a 3D desktop, and people are actually blown away by this, you know, to actually see it in use and in action and that sort of thing. And I actually bring a few blank CDs with me from time to time. Because if anybody really wants a copy of it, I'm happy to give them a free copy that they can just load into their system at home and try it themselves. Obviously, I'm giving them a copy of Pinguy OS, which does have the Compiz effects and that sort of thing, not set up the way I have them configured. But the thing is, you know, at least people get a chance to have a look at it and try it and see if it's something that they're going to use. Uh, the Arch Noob, your turn. Oh, sorry, I was just sitting here playing a game. Um, well, Linux gaming is, it's okay. I mean, Linux has some really good games. They really do. Will they ever be able to compete as far as popularity goes with, say, Windows games? No. But if you can get Wine configured just right, there's really no problem with running a Windows game on a Linux system. I've never had much of a problem with it. Sure, you've had to tweak everything every now and then to get it to work the way you want it to, but that's what, to me, Linux is about. Tweaking this, tweaking that, making it work. 
Wow, this has been an invigorating conversation, you all. Uh, we've got, um, yeah, we've got quite a long little recording here. Uh, so, uh, real quick, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, thank everybody for appearing on the show today, all of my uh, subscribers and contributors that have shown up he here today. This has been a wonderful discussion. And to all of my uh, listeners on YouTube, once again, thank you all for listening to the show. And all of you are welcome to join us on XChat IRC as well as Mumble. I have that the, the link to the linuxdistrocommunity.com in the show notes, which gives you all the instructions and everything that you need for connecting. We're always here on Saturday nights at 8 p.m. New York time. There is also a time zone calculator so that you can figure out what time in your time zone so that you can join us because I know in Europe it's uh, Sunday already. It's uh, 10, 15 here in, here, um, here in Florida. But uh, we've been at this for a while, so doing two shows and that sort of thing. Google+, Plus, Facebook, and Twitter will keep you all up to date every time I send a new video to my channel. Thank you all again for watching. Check out Edward12's channel. I'll have a link in the show notes for that. Thank you for co-hosting, Edward. We will see you all next time. Mm -hmm.